I'm, I'm going to ad lib a tiny little bit. Um, I don't expect to be able to reach the eloquence of the speakers that we um, had this morning. Uh, I'm by no means that fast on my feet or that uh, cultured that I can compete like that. But this is about the report on the Senate inquiry in 2016. Now, those of you that are my age will remember, Houston, we've got a problem. <laughs> Now, there was a group of people, the other side of the moon, in a lunar module, unable to get back to Earth without an enormous amount of help. And humanity is a wonderful thing. They called for help, they got listened to, and they got brought back all the way to their families. The whole world watched. It was transparent. You could see it on television. You could hear the reports. You could hear them speaking. This first Senate inquiry was like that. APRA, we've got a problem. And this time, we got listened to by the Senate of Australia. And this time, some changes have been made. Not enough, and we've got another inquiry. This time, those of us that work on the ground, who know the problems in their environment, out there on the moon, in the lunar landscape of the theatres and the operating theatres and the hospital wards, who see what happens, who see the threats to nurses and other doctors, if you don't behave, you'll be reported to APRA. That doesn't go down in their statistics. That doesn't get reported. But you and I know it happens, and I've seen it happen in my director of medical service time at the Mata Hospital in Townsville. So I know it's there. We have to convince them that it happens, and that kindness and care might make a difference, but unless they join us and let us join them, that may not happen. There's always an elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room, I hope, is the fact that there is a problem and it must be addressed. And we, HAPARA, are part of that solution. We have stood as a profession far too long on the sidelines and not put our heads up to actually take this on. Because most of us like to protect our families, our incomes, our um, referrals, and our practices. We are like sheep. When one of our flock is attacked, the flock moves away. Instead of actually standing firm and pushing their legs and feet over the perpetrators of vexatious reports. And I'll go on later and tell you why we must not call them vexatious reports, but that, that's what we actually do now. So we are part of the solution. And we needed to get evidence, and we needed to get facts. And Professor John Whitehall told us at our annual meeting last year, you have a lack of facts, you have a lack of numbers, you have a lack of cases. There isn't a lack of them, they're owned by APRA. And we don't have access to them because they claim confidentiality. But our membership is growing. So we did our survey of our members of what actually happens. So we have evidence of what happens to us and our members, and we can make our own decisions about whether they were dishonest complaints. Dishonest complaints. Not vexatious. Vexatious is a trivial word. Dishonest is different. It means mendacious and doing it for venal reasons. And that's exactly what happens with those reports. So are we representative? Well, of those that did the survey, more than half of our membership did the survey. But not half of our membership have had reports to APRA about them. We have members who have never had a report, who just know what's going on and want to change it. Most of them come from the three big states where most of the complaints are made. You'll notice, those of you that are observant, we missed out a group. The ACT. Now, a lot of us, basically in the regions of Australia, don't really have much time for the ACT because their government doesn't have much time for the regions. They concentrate on the big cities. If you get a report against you and you are in regional Australia, it's the worst possible thing because the experts are all in the cities. You don't have support. Are we representative of those from overseas? Well, probably we are. I don't know the exact figures of overseas registrations in Australia. I think it was in the latest medical board report. But the truth is, a significant number of our members are from overseas, and most of these people are in the regions. 
where they don't get support, where the tri most trivial mistake gets because you were trained in Bangladesh or India or Russia or somewhere else. And they actually have no one to discuss it with. They don't get supervision, they have no one to turn it off. But the majority of the people who actually answered were from Australia and Australian trained. And most of us are registered. So we're not people complaining because we're being deregistered. We represent mostly the average practitioner in Australia. And I, you know, people have said to me, oh, you're just there because you had two complaints against you. It's not true. I might be there for that, but a lot of our members aren't. They recognise dishonesty when they see it. They're just not going to put their head up. They're in the flock that's moving away from us. So if you look at this, how many legs does the elephant have? Everything is based on perspective. The perspective of APRA is to protect our population. Now it was nicely pointed out in some of the talks today that you and I happen to be part of the population. Surprise to APRA. They can protect us too. Has there ever been anybody suffer any consequences from a dishonest report? There may have been one recently. I can't remember seeing in any of the medical board reports a single report of somebody suffering any consequence to making a vexatious report or dishonest report. <coughs> so there were four chapters in the, uh, uh, in the report. There was an introduction which was general and non-specific as all these things do, that thank everybody that gave it, mentioned all the different people that did it. But it did recognise that complaints are used as a tool of harassment. And we have evidence of that from our membership. That bullying and harassment in the medical profession really does occur and really is a problem. They were told enough by everybody. And they made several responses and recommendations which I'll come back to. But I'd like to sort of uh, go on and talk to you a little bit about our survey. Because this is what we know and we can talk about. Of those report, how long it takes for the notification to be resolved? And that was the crux of my question this morning. If it takes two years to solve a problem and a person is found to have nothing to answer for, then the report is the punishment for doing nothing wrong. People in this time, and I'll use Richard Emery as an example, was forced out of our country, a country where you're supposed to have a fair go. His family was forced out. He was so sick that he had a psychiatrist and he nearly committed suicide. He used to communicate with me regularly about him. He had to work under 17 restrictions, both put on him by the hospital and by APRA. Every week his cases were checked. Every week his cases were vetoed or allowed to go for the next day. And yet, the dishonest reporters who weren't at the audit put him in again. It finished him off. The best advice I could give to him as Director of Medical Services, they're out to get you, mate, and you're in a place where you've got no defence. Go home. I felt so sorry to have to say that to him, but that's what I said because I was a coward. I wasn't willing to take these people on about what they did. And when that was reported to his legal representatives, I have no idea whether APRA got told that those people weren't at his audit. So the punishment is in the report. How many of our staff, how many of our members have restrictions on their practice? Not many. Some have had it and they're gone. And there are a few who are retired. What are the number of reports per individual reported? Well, you can see there that about 50% just had one report. But look at the numbers down below. Am I doing something wrong? It's too close. Okay, I always get told I talk too quietly. Um, but look at the numbers down below. Look at the number of reports that the people that were reported consider were vexatious. It's their assessment, and I suppose there'll be a bias there, because of they, they would. But it can't be that many. And then... Uh, the number of notifications per reported member. 
I think I just showed that, didn't I? I must have gone back. So anyway, they got around. So, so it is really a really life-changing event to be reported, and a particularly if it's a dishonest report, because APRA will investigate it, and it will take some time, and it will damage your reputation. I have not been able to practice intensive care in Townsville since the reports at either hospital. I can practice as a locum all over Queensland not in council, because they damaged me and my reputation. So the six recommendations were that you must, everybody must acknowledge, recognise and commit all parties, hospitals, APRA, health boards, the whole lot have to commit to admit it, it happens. Universities have to adopt a curriculum with compulsory education. I'm proud to be in James Cook University, because for the last four years, before this happened, We've been teaching our students in their final year about being reported and resilience. We actually upfront tell them that it's likely to happen to them. We surveyed our medical students, 50% of them had been bullied. 50%. Universities must accept responsibility and develop procedures because we found out with that Senate that the universities take no responsibility for students in the behaviour of doctors towards them. Hospitals must change their code of conduct. Well, it hasn't happened at our hospital yet. I don't think it's happened in the Australian Medical Board either. The colleges should release an annual report regarding the incidents of bullying and harassment. I don't think they're ever going to do that really accurately. And we've got the new inquiry, which is what you expect to happen in Australia. We have one inquiry, then we have about 10 more before we do anything. Imagine if you were on that Luna module and they decide to have an inquiry how to get you back. Houston, we've got a problem. Who makes the notification? The vast majority come from someone in your workplace. And, and now, rather than industrially solving things, people are using, and doctors are using, instead of actually dismissing a doctor, you get reported to APRA. So then they can suspend you. So you can't practice. So you're stopped, immediately stopped. As soon as you get a report to APRA, you have to tell all your employers. I had to tell the university, I had to tell the hospitals where I did locums, I had to tell the private hospitals, I had to tell everybody. So immediately you're under suspicion. So, so that's who makes the notifications. So we know that now. I don't know what APRA's figures are, but hopefully they might release them one day. So will it bring change? Well, goodness, it must bring change. Um, we must... Um, address mandatory and inappropriate reporting. We must have legislation that actually goes across the states. We must have standards for peer review. We can't have the bog set approach anymore. A bunch of guys sitting around a table. There's got to be a reason, there's got to be a standard which they do their peer review to. They didn't do that in Townsville. I was there, I saw it. And there has to be a change to our codes of conduct and there has to be justice. How we are treated by APRA? Well, you can see there. Of those reported, of those people in our membership, 70% thought they weren't treated well. The future, more stakeholder engagement and all those things. We must hold APRA to the same standards we are. There must be never events. There are never events in medicine. We never chop off the wrong leg. And if we do, there's a big investigation. There never be, should be somebody investigated who did nothing wrong. It's a never event. We must have transparency. You must be able to find out who the anonymous person was that reported you. We must hold them to the same standard. They must actually meet the standards we have to meet. Let's be fair about this. Australians understand fairness. And to those who answered, are they approachable? They're not approachable. I've tried to get to APRA. It's really hard. You try and talk to the medical book, the, uh, Joanna Flynn. It's not possible. Virtually impossible to even find out a contact email address. I hope I'm wrong about that. So do you think you were supported? 95% don't think they got any support from APRA, HQCC or the Ombudsman. Well, their lawyers unfortunately are just servants of APRA and they take the information to you and you have to reply. 
So anyway, even in, even in the APRA's um, investigation and study that was published in the Medical Journal of Australia, they found these problems, and this is from their final paragraph. They found exactly the same problems that I'm saying to you. And they said that we have to actually study it. We haven't seen any studies yet. And there was one doctor. All right, I'll finish. Um, and I'll just go back to that. So I'll, I'll finish there, but there obviously is a problem, Houston. We need help.